So I'll give a, a quick introduction of who will be joining us. So our first presenter will be Dustin Chow. He's a software engineer at Gatsby. And Dustin um, is an avid speaker, presenter, and open source enthusiast. We also are really happy to have some guest presenters here today with um, a Harry's company called Flamingo. So first is Tim Brown. Tim Brown is an experienced software engineer in New York City who builds for the web, and he is a senior engineer at Harry's. Also joining him will be Johnny Lin, who leads front, a front-end team that builds platforms for new brands at Harry's. He was previously at um, Vimeo as a front-end engineer. We also have a couple of great panelists joining us. Many of you will already know um, Sam Bagwatt and Kyle Matthews, co-founders of Gatsby. Um, Sam also is passionate about making the web fast, um, and he comes from us um, from software engineering experience at Zenefits and Plan Grid. And then, of course, Kyle Matthews is co-founder and creative of Gatsby, creator of Gatsby. He's passionate about making building websites easier and a better developer, developer experience, as well as a better user experience. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter, Dustin, who will be talking about um, the main portion of the presentation around what makes Gatsby great and behind the scenes. All right. Thanks, Linda. Sure. Just got to share my screen. Yep. Passing you the controls. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining. I'm super excited to talk about this today. Um, so this, this central idea is what makes Gatsby great. And I think Gatsby is great from a variety of perspectives. Uh, I think Gatsby has a great ecosystem. Um, I think Gatsby has a great community. Um, for instance, if you make a PR to Gatsby, you instantly get added um, to our maintainers group and you get some free swag. And so these are like often understated benefits of what makes Gatsby great. But while these certainly are great, this isn't necessarily what I want to focus on today. I want to kind of focus on uh, more performance and like uh, developer and user experience type things. And from this perspective, kind of construct the argument of how Gatsby is great from this perspective. Um, and of course, the ones I've already mentioned. So to begin doing this, uh, I'd like to kind of construct four pillars to this argument. Each one of these pillars will be a section of this talk. So the first one is server side rendering, uh, commonly uh, called SSR, um, what it is, why it matters, and how Gatsby uses it. Um, the next one will be route-based code splitting. The next one will be modern APIs in Gatsby, and uh, it's probably my favorite uh, portion of this. Uh, and then finally, um, it'll be some pragmatic techniques for asserting that your app is actually blazing fast. Uh, for anyone who's been to one of these webinars before or read our documentation, we say that Gatsby gets you blazing fast sites. And so I think it's important that you know how to actually prove and assert this as well. So this webinar kind of started with this Reddit um, thread. And um, the, the thread started with genuine question. Every page is loaded immediately on click. Seriously never seen such a quick website before. Any insight as to how they're able to achieve this? And so it was really like interesting, uh, enthralling, and like gratifying to see this because the site they're actually trying to reverse engineer is reactjs.org, which as you may or may not know, is a Gatsby.js application. And so it was really fun to watch them um, be like, oh, they're doing this and they're doing this. And so this 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 whole idea of this webinar, um, at least my portion, was to kind of go into a little bit more depth and to kind of show how we do this kind of behind the scenes. And you know, what are these techniques that we use that makes Gatsby great? And, and it, uh, it provides a great developer and user experience. So the first pillar, like I mentioned, is SSR or server side rendering. And so some key ideas here. Um, the first of which is that Gatsby generates static HTML via server-side rendering APIs. And when I'm saying this, uh, people are probably already thinking, well, Gatsby isn't server-rendered. Like, you're, you're like lying to me. And that's, that's true in some sense. Um, but it is server-side rendered at build time uh, rather than at runtime, which requires like a Node.js server. And so to kind of begin constructing you know, what this looks like, I think it's helpful to take a look at a Gatsby component. So this is like the foundational building block. This is a React component. So this is our index route. We're importing um, a component content. We're importing a component layout. And we're rendering a paragraph tag. This will be rendered to a static HTML string via something that looks kind of like this. And so these are React DOM SSR APIs. Uh, a, a particular note is React DOM server.render to string. That'll basically take a React component 
In this case, we're going to render our index route and it's going to render it to an HTML file in our public directory. So this is a very, very simplified version of what Gatsby is doing and how it's invoking these server-side rendering uh, APIs at build time rather than at runtime. And so the result of a call quite like this is going to look something like this. So we'll generate an index HTML um, and it'll have a wrapping div, so or a root div. So this div ID of triple underscore Gatsby will have a header that was from our layout component and then we'll have some content. So it's actually kind of interesting, um, a really good marker of knowing whether it's a Gatsby site is if you see this root level div with that ID, it's almost certainly a Gatsby site. Um, and so you might be thinking like, you know, like neat. Um, this is, this is pretty cool, I guess, but like, why would you want to do this? Why would you want to invoke these SSR APIs at build time? And I think minimally, there are like three uh, cornerstones of kind of like why you want to do this. The first of which is performance. Um, so it seems kind of like obvious, but um, when you are using React, you're going to eventually produce HTML, particularly if you aren't static rendering or server rendering. Um, you're going to load, parse that JavaScript, evaluate it, and then eventually output HTML to the DOM. With Gatsby, you can um, kind of uh, get rid of that eventually step and you can return static HTML as much as possible up front. And then we have a, a, um, an, uh, a runtime that picks up uh, where it left off. So performance is a huge win um, and, um, of, of static rendering. The next of which is SEO. So in the same way that we're generating you know, actual HTML content, we can generate meta tags and necessary SEO tags so that you can get you know, uh, maximized SEO, maximized uh, eyes on your great content. And then finally, is that static content is easy. So I wanna go into a little bit more depth uh, on this assertion. So uh, static content is easy. And so to begin constructing this argument, I think it's helpful to kind of uh, illustrate the alternative approach. And the alternative approach is runtime SSR. And so when you kind of wave goodbye to this runtime server-side rendering approach, I think you also say goodbye to scaling issues to provisioning servers, to increasing costs, and in general, uh, I think you say goodbye to pain. And so it's kind of easy to think if you're launching a new site and your site goes viral with like a runtime SSR approach, you're gonna need to spin up, you know, N number of servers to handle that load. Some of those servers might have issues, they might need to like cycle, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And so I think it's really easy to imagine um, many scenarios where this is a lot more challenging to implement cleanly and it can lead to some increasing costs. The flip side, um, I think when you say hello to build time SSR, I think you get a application that's easily scalable. Um, you know, you can host it on any static content host. You can also host it on the edge. So you can use CloudFront as a CDN layer. You can use Fastly. Um, you can kind of use whatever you want because static content is easy to host, easily scalable, and you don't really need to worry um, of like handling that load if your application does go viral. And you know, which that's what we all want at the end of the day. Uh, and I, I think you also say hello to like um, super cost effective uh, hosting. It's, it's very cheap uh, to be able to host, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript. And I think all of these factors coalesce into this saying hello to bliss. And so to begin kind of like wrapping this up, um, this is the key takeaway. Gatsby apps are server side rendered at build time. This process creates static HTML, which can be deployed effectively anywhere. There are some huge cost savings of this approach. There are some huge, um, uh, like wins as far as like um, being generally easier. And I think this is like the way that I'd really recommend you structure your applications. And so again, uh, let's take a step back and say once more with effect, static, static assets, so HTML, CSS, and JavaScript does not mean a static app. Gatsby produces a fully functional dynamic React application. Um, kind of the way I like to describe it is that Gatsby produces create React app. So once your, app, once your Gatsby application hits the browser, you get a fully functional React app. And so if you're interested in this topic and want to learn more about building apps with Gatsby, we have a previous webinar on just this topic that's worth checking out. So the next pillar of this is route-based code splitting. So in Gatsby and in similar frameworks, we have this convention of the source directory. Inside the source, direct inside the source directory is the pages directory. The pages directory contains a number of React components named things like about, index and contact. The index route is going to be my root level. It's going to directly map to an index.html, about will be, an, will be about.html, um, et cetera, et cetera. This is a pretty common convention. Each JavaScript file is going to export a React component and that'll be parsed at build time using those, using those SSR APIs to generate static HTML. 
So when we talk about route-based code splitting, there are a few considerations. The first of which is this comments chunk. So this comments chunk is going to kind of uh, chunk and group your vendor dependencies. These vendor dependencies are going to change pretty infrequently. Um, you might upgrade your version of React to get like hook support, let's say, and you'll get a new comments chunk, a new uh, hash when that happens. And so these are dependencies that are going to be likely um, shared by you know, like each of your routes. And so we'll generate one or two of these comments chunks that are used on you know, each of your routes. And so what this looks like in Gatsby um, is uh, if you look in your public directory, you might see an app dot and then like a unique hash, that's a comments chunk. And, and that means that it's going to be shared between multiple routes. And so the nice thing of doing this is that uh, you can cache these really effectively at the CDM layer and in the browser layer. And so when you navigate to separate routes, you're going to reuse that JavaScript that you already parsed, loaded, and evaluated. But this isn't necessarily how every application can be structured. So uh, if we think of a different route, so this is our contact page. Our contact page might have different considerations, different libraries, uh, different functionality than some of our other routes. And so in particular, um, a contact page will almost certainly have a form. And so a form, you might need different libraries than you would on your index route. So for instance, here, I'm importing Formic, which is a great form library. I'm importing Yup, which is a great schema validation library. And I can like build this really quickly and cleanly utilizing React and libraries that we know and love. Uh, but there's, uh, in theory, there's like a cost here. I don't want Formic and Yup and any dependencies on this contact route to end up on other routes, particularly if they're not used. And so in Gatsby, we have this route-based code splitting. So if it's under some threshold, um, those dependencies will be grouped with just that page and they won't show up on other pages. So um, I think the contact route is a great example, but you can also have like a super, super heavy route. You don't want any of those dependencies to slow down your entire application uh, just because of one you know, slow or heavier page. Um, and Gatsby's concept and notion of route-based code splitting enables us to build this out really cleanly. So what this ends up looking like is a directory structure like this in your public folder. So I've, 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 I've simplified this quite a bit, uh, but the idea I hope comes across. So we have a 404 directory inside an index.html. We have this nine and then a unique hash about contact index, et cetera. So if we kind of go through this, this is our comments chunk. This is going to contain the shared JavaScript and libraries that are going to be used on each of these routes. And this will be referenced in this contact page, this index page, this 404 page, and this about page. Next, we have these components. These are actually not going to be the vendor, not going to be the vendor dependencies. These are going to be a JavaScript representation of our pages. And then finally, we have this nine dash. This is actually the split uh, contents of the contact dependencies. So this will contain things like Formic and Yup and things that are unique to just this contact page. So like I said, to kind of like wrap this up, uh, route-based code splitting is something you want. Uh, it's fairly challenging to implement in non-Gatsby solutions. Uh, and just by using Gatsby, you get this great performance optimization for free. So uh, this next section is modern APIs and Gatsby. And like I hinted at earlier, for me, this is the fun part. This is the part that I'm really excited and really passionate about, uh, as well as the previous parts. But I, I think this is the, the, the section in particular that um, is really interesting to people because they might not know some of these techniques that we're doing under the hood. So uh, I'm going to talk about a few APIs um, and kind of techniques. The first of which is intersection observer. The uh, next is link release prefetching. And then finally, responsive images, which kind of uses some of these previous techniques. So these are the, the modern APIs and the modern techniques that I'll be going in depth on. So intersection observer. This is a browser API to perform some action when some element enters or leaves the viewport. And so this might not seem super intuitive, so I think an example is helpful. So this is a simple code sandbox I put together. We have a number of these squares and like a sample representation of like a scrollable container. You can see that uh, this is visible now. Once it begins to exit the viewport, it's not visible. And so we fire uh, an exit. And so you see it's visible, not visible, visible, not visible. So Intersection Observer is an API uh, in, uh, uh, enabled in most browsers that gives us this functionality. And we can use this functionality to do um, really great things from a, from, a, from a performance basis. The next of which um, is link release prefetching. And so this is a technique uh, 
that'll prefetch the next resource when the browser is idle. So if there's something that you want to make available really quickly, um, you can use this. You can add a link release with um, of, of prefetch, and this will um, add this to um, your browser's uh, head tags, and it'll uh, make this resource readily available when the browser has time to download it. So if the browser is you know doing heavy operations, it won't fire these. But when the browser is kind of like idle and like ready for additional info, then it'll fire these tags, and then you'll get content. Um, really quickly. And so this is another great API that we leverage. And so to illustrate this, I have a simple example. This is a representation of Gatsby Link, which we'll show in a little bit more depth. Um, but if I hover, it's actually going to send a um, like an actual fetch rather than just a prefetch. So the Gatsby Link component works in like kind of two steps. It uses an intersection observer to send like an idle request to prefetch this resource. And then once we hover, it's going to send an actual fetch request because it's pretty likely that we're going to click this link and want these resources available. So by the time we actually click this, our next route is already available instantly. And so this is the, the one of the key techniques that I think have led uh, to Gatsby being called like blazing fast. Like it feels like you know everything's loading instantly. Um, this is enabled with uh, prefetching, preloading, and intersection observer and the Gatsby link component. Pretty cool stuff. Oh, but wait, you know there's more. So this is an awesome PR from Adi Asmani, who most are familiar with. Uh, he works for Google, um, awesome all-around guy. And so he sent a PR um, that, that will basically allow us to um, uh, kind of like opt out of this prefetching uh, um, technique if we're on a very slow connection. So if we're on a 2G connection, uh, prefetching all of those resources actually could slow down the entire page. Um, and, in, 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 and in addition, um, if we want to save data, um, you know, if we're um, heavily constrained by like the cost of our network, um, uh, we can leverage both of these APIs and we can not prefetch in these scenarios, which actually can be advantageous. And so the code for this is actually pretty simple. This is um, real code from Gatsby Core. So we're just checking if, um, if the connection effective type is 2G, we're not going to prefetch. And additionally, if we are on like a, a connection that wants to save data, we will also not prefetch. So these are actually, so these kind of micro optimizations, uh, I think are key things that Gatsby can enable and that you get these for free just by using Gatsby, just by updating Gatsby as we make more of these optimizations. Finally, there's responsive laserly loaded images. And this is enabled with the Gatsby image component. So um, I can show a quick little demo. Um, so this is the Gatsby image component. Um, we have this blur up effect um, many of you have probably seen this. We have this traced SVG effect. So as you scroll, an intersection observer is actually going to fire, and it'll load this in place. So what I can actually show here is if I simulate the network to a fast 3G and then refresh the page, you can see this um, work a little bit more clearly, more, more cleanly. So as we scroll, the intersection observers are going to fire. And those traced SVGs are going to uh, appear in um, in place. And so this is a great performance technique because we aren't loading you know, these massive images uh, below the fold. We're loading these images on demand uh, as the user scrolls to see them. It's pretty cool stuff. So again, uh, the, the, the two kind of like deep dive techniques I've covered uh, are loading larger images once they enter the viewport, and then prefetching the pages in the background once they enter the viewport, and additionally, um, sending like um, sending an actual fetch once we mouse over um, so that those are available and not just idling in the background. And so we'll come back to this with another demo. And so what all of these kind of performance techniques and this deep dive was is intended to like show is that Gatsby is your compiler for the web. Gatsby internalizes these great techniques, these micro optimizations, these techniques that you want and that your users want, and it and these are enabled for free just by using Gatsby. And so I think an analogy is helpful here. If we think of a um, like a buffering video, if we hover over it, it's going to start buffering up. It's going to basically like anticipate our next move. And then by the time we actually want to watch the video, the video is already buffered, ready, available. This is, this is a great user experience, and this is the kind of user experience we enable with Gatsby. So like I said, I'd like to end with some pragmatic techniques for actually asserting your app is blazing fast. So, I think the easiest is Chrome audits, um, often oftentimes called Lighthouse. This is baked into Chrome. 
So if you open up your developer tools, open up the audits tab, you can just uh, click run audits and it'll uh, on a variety of metrics like performance, like SEO, accessibility, et cetera, it will actually uh, give you like a score out of 100 and it'll give you like actionable feedback for how you can improve your score. Web page test is another one I really, really like, webpagetest.org. Um, I like it particularly because it tends to be a bit more real world representative. My Lighthouse scores sometimes vary. Web page test tends to be um, a little bit more real world. And how this actually works and what this looks like is you pick a device. So here I've picked a Moto uh, G, like an older Android device. I've uh, selected 3G fast, and I can see a variety of meaningful metrics like load time, speed index, first interactive, et cetera, and I get grades. Um, so pretty much A's across the board. And so this is a great technique to kind of like assert that your app is fast and not just like guess that it's fast. And so both of these are great, but I also think it's important to automate as much as, as, as much as possible. And in particular, I think it's really impactful to catch performance regressions at PR time. So I have a really quick demo here. And so this is a Gatsby Perf audit repo. Um, what I've done here is I have tried to intentionally make Gatsby super slow. Um, and so uh, if we look at this diff here, I have imported a number of dependencies, Axios, Bootstrap, jQuery, because, you know, reasons, Lodash, et cetera, et cetera. I'm doing like bad patterns, anti-patterns, don't do these. Um, I'm, I'm uh, accessing a ref, I'm using jQuery to augment the text, like just terrible, terrible all around bad stuff. And I'm importing a ton of dependencies to do what I don't need uh, uh, to do uh, with, with this way. And so what, we've, what I've actually done here is I built in a CI check using Circle CI that will actually um, fail a PR if uh, we detect that the Lighthouse metrics um, are uh, causing a regression. So because we're using Gatsby, my standard is that you know everything should be a hundreds. And you can see here that even after my efforts to make this like really, really slow, I still score 99 out of 100 on performance, which is pretty incredible. Um, and so you can see here, we have a little, little table at the end, performance, accessibility, best practices, SEO. And so this is like a really quick way to fail fast when you, when you think something will introduce a regression, and in particular, a performance regression. And so I think some key ideas here with Gatsby is that performance isn't optional. It's baked in, and you get it for free just by using Gatsby. And in particular, you get these optimizations and micro-optimizations available uh, to you and to your users who will really thank you. So I have uh, a poll question. So yeah, definitely check this out um, and then select which of these is most important to you. Yeah, so I just launched the poll. Everyone should be able to see it. We're asking what performance optimization feature is most important to you? So just kind of think through what D Dustin just went through. Um, if there's one that's important to you that's not listed here, you can go ahead and put that in the question or the chat window. Um, otherwise, if you can cast your vote, I see quite a few votes coming in. So the options are image optimization with Gatsby image or fast initial paid load, page load time, fast subsequent page interaction such as prefetching or route based code splitting. So it looks like we have about 50% voted so far. I'll give it another minute to get a few more votes in and then we'll share the results. Also, just a quick reminder, we have a lot of questions coming in the Q&A chat window, which is great, so keep them coming. I know Sam and Kyle are working on answering your questions as they come, and we'll also have time at the end of the webinar to address those questions as well. Okay, and it looks like we have a good number of votes, so I'm going to close the poll and then share the results. Okay, so it looks like fast initial paid load time is um, definitely one of the most important features at 71%. Then the next two image optimization and subsequent page load times are kind of tied for second. Well, even route based code splitting. So everything else comes in second with initial page load time um, first. Okay, back to Dustin. Okay, thanks, Linda. Thanks everyone for voting. Cool to see that. So uh, I'd like to end with a demo. So um, what I've done here is I have made two versions of the gatsbyjs.org uh, site. Um, I've made one where um, I've uh, enabled prefetching, which again is enabled by default. 
And then I've also made one where prefetching is not enabled. Um, in this one, I have a little visual guide. So when you see a rocket ship, um, that, in, that, resource, that link has been preloaded and prefetched in the background. And when you see eyes, that means that the intersection observer has uh, caught this link and it's going to add um, an idle prefetch so that you can get the content when it's ready. And so if I refresh this page, the first thing you can do is you can see in the head tags, we're going to add a bunch of these prefetches. And so these prefetches are going to be um, when the browser's idle, like I was saying earlier, and these are going to basically make it so that when we click these links, these are going to be really, really fast and really, really responsive. Uh, things that your users want. So next, if we actually hover over a link, for instance, this get started link, um, now it's now it's ready to go. It's been loaded. If we look at our network tab, we've already loaded the JSON that's required for this page, so that when we click this page, it loads like it, it loads effectively instantly. And so this isn't like a clear demonstration because I'm on a pretty fast network. Um, so let's tweak this a little bit. Let's do fast 3G. Let's turn off the service worker so we don't get uh, false caching. Let's refresh the page. And so you can see Intersection Observer has fired for each of these. Loaded. Click, and it's ready, even on, a, even on a 3G connection. And so this works really great. Of course, I can click through whatever. It's loaded, loaded, you know, um, very, very fast navigation. We can contrast this with um, this version, which does not have any prefetching enabled. This is a custom fork. Gatsby that I've provided here. Um, and so if we inspect our head tags, we can see that we don't have any of the prefetches because the intersection observer isn't firing and I'm not doing any of these performance optimizations. So if we open up our, our, our network tab and do fast 3G, refresh the page, check the network tab, make sure we're not, and the, so it's, it's actually quite a bit slower. It's actually from the service worker. So the Gatsby plugin offline is fighting me here. So if I refresh this page one more time without a service worker, this won't be cached. I click on it, and it takes a couple seconds to load. So it's clear um, the like impact that prefetching, preloading, and some of these um, uh, performance optimizations make for, for you and for your end users, even on slow connections. So to kind of wrap this up, I think I, I really like this idea of perceived performance. And so this is from Smashing Magazine's front end checklist, uh, which is linked in this quote. And they say, one way or another, rather than focusing on full page loading time, prioritize page loading as perceived by your customers. That means focusing on a slightly different set of metrics. In fact, choosing the right metric is a process without obvious winners. And so the key idea here is that just as important as actual performance is perceived performance. And I, I think perceived performance and actual performance are both able to be maximized when you use Gatsby. And so uh, I, I think your, 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 your users will really thank you, and I urge you to build with Gatsby. I can't wait to see what you build next. And so from that, I'll now pass it off to Linda uh, once more. Great. Thanks, Dustin. Uh, really appreciate that overview. There have been a lot of questions that come in as well. So um, I know Kyle and Sam are tackling those, but Dustin, if you all also want to jump in and, and start answering some of those questions. And I'm now going to um, send it over to Johnny Lynn and Tim Brown um, with Harry's and Flamingo. And they will go into a case study about how they use Gatsby to launch a new product. Um, let me make sure I... Um, great. Just sent you the controls, Johnny. All right, thank you, Linda. Let's get set up here. Yep, and I can see your screen. Cool, great. All right, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so like uh, Linda mentioned, uh, Tim and I are on the engineering team at Harry's, and we're part of uh, the team that builds platforms for new brands, including Flamingo. But before we get into Flamingo specifically, let's talk a bit about um, Harry's as a company, just to give some context. So yeah, Harry's um, is a men's grooming company that was founded in 2013. Uh, we sell razors and other men's grooming products. And Harry's started as an online company, so even though we are in retail now, e-commerce has always been a core part of our business. And yeah, after seeing the demand for women's line, uh, we had already like a million female customers buying Harry's products. We were getting requests for a line designed for women, 
So after seeing all that demand, a group of women uh, within Harry's decided to launch a new brand. And our engineering team was tasked to build a new online platform for that brand. So what I'll talk about next is the challenge we were facing. Uh, because Harry's is a fairly big company, we, uh, Flamingo is going to be a big product launch um, that had to handle a lot of traffic with, yeah, not a lot of room for failure. Um, because Flamingo would be a new brand building a following from the ground up, we wanted to make sure things like website issues or downtime didn't negatively affect the launch and impact first impressions of the brand. Uh, we were dealing with a fairly tight timeline as well, uh, just a matter of months. And most visitors would be coming in on mobile as well. And we knew we needed performance out of the box because um, you know, after our time at Harry's, we knew performance is a very big factor when it comes to online shopping. And it's especially important on mobile as you know, bounce rates tend to be higher. Yeah. So, hey, I'm Tim. Um, and yeah, like Johnny said, um, we were sort of tasked with making this decision about like the technical uh, architecture and infrastructure for this new brand, Flamingo. Um, but it wasn't just about uh, Flamingo. It was also, we sort of had this plan to, to launch more brands over the, over the next few years. And so we wanted to just kind of take this opportunity and survey a landscape and see like what, if any new tools had come out, because just sort for context, um, Harry's.com launched in 2013 and it's, built on Rails and um, it's been a great and like very successful website, but we sort of just wanted to take the time and see like, you know, is there anything new out there that was potentially interesting or exciting? And um, that's about the time that we sort of first discovered Gatsby. Um, and we started getting really excited about it as we learned more about it. Um, for our team, uh, Gatsby was sort of the, the, was the tool that reintroduced us to this idea of static publishing. Um, we had used static publishing before, you know, we had like a, an engineering blog that ran on Jekyll. And so we were sort of familiar with the idea of it, but had, I think, pigeonholed it a little bit into like, oh yeah, you know, you might build like a, a static simple blog with it, but you wouldn't build like a modern, highly interactive web app in it. Um, and, you know, it was when we sort of discovered Gatsby that we realized that didn't have to be a case that you didn't have to compromise necessarily on the, uh, the interactivity of your site. And you could use all these tools that you love, like React and GraphQL and stuff. Um, we were also really excited about its integrations with just all sorts of data providers, but especially with third-party CMS systems. Um, we'd had some experience maintaining our own custom CMS and knew that we wanted to go with third-party CMS this time around, and uh, Gatsby's story there was really exciting. Um, and then, like, a lot of those things that Dustin was just talking about, all of the additional things for performance, you know, outside of just the general architecture of Gatsby, from image optimizations, code splitting, prefetching, um, we had had experience sort of implementing those by hand on, on the harrys.com website and knew how time consuming that was to get right and how tricky it was and how much specialized knowledge it, it required. And so having a framework make those smart decisions for us and kind of get it out of our hair was really compelling. And we knew we'd be able to spend more time sort of delivering on the, the product itself. Um, and yeah, just as part of that, uh, sort of our experience with harrys.com, we knew that, you know, oftentimes, uh, the more you think about performance at the beginning of a project, the better prepared uh, you'll probably be in the long term. Um, it's a bit harder to sort of bolt on performance after the fact. And, you know, starting a project with Gatsby, we knew that we would be, have a really strong foundation to sort of uh, grow into the future on. Um, and so once we decided on Gatsby, we sort of needed to figure out you know, what other pieces of architecture we'd need around it. Um, like I said, we've had experience with sort of a standard like Rails web server architecture, um, but we're sort of planning to play to some of Gatsby's strengths here and try out some sort of fun, new, interesting things in the process. Um, so we chose Contentful for our CMS, um, has really great integration with Gatsby and our the great UI that our marketing team and product team love. Um, we were already using Fastly as our CDN for harrys.com um, and we're big fans of Fastly. Um, they have a great sort of global edge network and allow you to do some intelligent programming at the edge for certain decisions we like. Um, Amazon S3 for storage, uh, we figured we could sort of just put those uh, built Gatsby files in there and then serve them behind Fastly. Uh, and then CircleCI is our CI system to sort of orchestrate all of this and, and publish and run our tests and things. Um, and so here's a diagram of what that looks like. Um, you can see that when a when a developer makes a code change, like they merge a PR into master on GitHub, we can kick off a circle build, which will run our tests um, and then run Gatsby build to actually go through that static 
file generation process, um, we can put those in S3, and then we can also notify Fastly that um, you know a new version of the site is ready to be served, uh, and then at that point it'll just be served out of Fastly, you know, in whatever CDN node is closest to the customer. Um, and it's actually the same exact, almost the exact same process for when someone makes a content change. So in Contentful, whenever a, a marketer or a product manager edits some piece of content, that just kicks off a very similar build in Circle CI, which can run our tests, go through the same process. Um, and we've just been really thrilled with this architecture. And again, want to echo what Dustin was saying about uh, not having to worry about scaling problems, like just serving static files out of Fastly is basically infinitely scalable for our purposes, or at least like as scalable as Fastly is, which we can we can take that <laughs> for our business. Um, and so, yeah, we were really excited about this architecture. Yeah, so then we um, started working on the site itself. Um, yeah, we spent our team, you know, worked on it for the next several months. And yeah, it really did um, feel like building a regular React app after some initial setup. We got to use technologies we were used to, technologies that we wanted, you know, Redux, style components, Cypress, just yeah, things that we wanted to use. And yeah, we tested performance uh, pretty close to launch and the results were great. We yeah, took a look at Lighthouse, uh, took a look at Speed Curve, and we had been kind of tracking performance as we were going, but when we were closer to launch, we had a much better picture of what our production site would be, and yeah, the numbers were looking really solid, really good. And then, um, yeah, launch day uh, finally came up, and our team had been working very hard for months and months, and the day yeah, finally came to launch, and there definitely was a lot of pressure, like, you know, as I'm sure a lot of you have been through, just uh, product launches uh, do have a lot of nervousness involved, and we had a lot of press lined up, we had magazines and other publications that were going to release their articles at a certain time, so we had to launch at a specific date and time. And yeah, we had you know the usual uncertainty of what might go wrong about the high traffic coming in, but yeah, then we flipped the switch and it was actually really smooth. Um, yeah, we were able to, or like Tim was mentioning, because of the architecture, it was on Fastly, and we were able to handle 10 times as much traffic as we're you know, seeing currently um, that happened at launch. And because there was no web server, um, we didn't really have you know, too much concern about scaling with uh, the high peaks of traffic that we were seeing. Yeah, so like Johnny said, the launch went really well. Um, and you know we had had such a good experience like during the sort of building and like leading up to the launch process with Gatsby, which I think we had anticipated. Um, but one of the sort of most pleasantly surprising things has, has come after launch, and that's in like what a like pleasure it is to uh, both sort of maintain and also even be on call for for this app and for this architecture. Um, there's just so few moving pieces compared to like sort of a traditional web server setup for the front end that. Uh, you know, it's 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 honestly really hard for to have downtime when you're just serving static assets out of a CDN. Um, it's you know you don't have the traditional sort of scaling worries. Um, your sort of build process just feels much more deterministic. Uh, it's a lot easier to sort of insert these these sanity checks at different points in that build process to to verify what you're pushing out. Um, and I think one of the 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 coolest things about what this architecture allowed us to do and what Gatsby allowed us to do was uh, we had a couple teammates join about a month before the launch. Um, and usually like sort of the, the training to go on call for our sort of traditional architectures, would we would expect it to take, you know, a couple months before people were ready for that. Um, whereas with this, people were able to be onboarded almost immediately and like were able to be present and around for that launch and have like a stake in it, even as like fairly new team members. Um, and so that was really exciting and I think empowering for, for the whole team. And here's a video of the site. Uh, this is shopflamingo.com, just to give you sort of some idea of some of the interaction and you know how quickly this thing loads. Um, you know, it was sort of built over the course of several months to be highly interactive and really tell the story of our brand since we were launching online for the first time. So just a quick idea of you know what the site actually looks like. You can see it at shopflamingo.com. And yeah, at the end of the day, so the results we you know we delivered the site that was you know five times as fast as our competitors on on some metrics like first meaningful paint um, and. I think there's there's some study that says for something to be perceived as uh, you know perceived as faster than another thing you're comparing it to, you need at least like 20% uh, improvement for people to perceive that. 
And we've seen some really interesting things when, when we're actually delivering performance like five times as fast as our competitors. Um, it goes from being this sort of like unconscious thing that people perceive to actually being a conscious feature of the site. Like we've had multiple customers call in and comment on how quick the site loads and it's the fastest site they've ever used. And you know, when, when, it's, when speed is like a feature of your website, it's, it's a really great outcome. Um, our marketing team really loves what this approach has, has given us uh, and has given them. Um, they're really quickly, easily able to change content and contentful and publish the site without getting developers involved. Um, we've got great SEO because of Gatsby's server-side rendering. Um, and I think it really just points to this sort of great synthesis of things where the customers love the site, it's got content that's relevant for them, it loads quickly, they can do their shopping. The marketing team really is really excited about it. They can update content and you know track how you know our search placement is doing and developers get the tools that they love um, like react and graphql and um it's sort of this great sort of win 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 situation with with gatsby and with this architecture um yeah and like we said you know performance and seo and conversion are really critical to our business as an e-commerce company and they've made it a whole lot easier by just sort of starting with gatsby in the first place and so looking forward to the future i think for us um we plan to sort of do more things with even more dynamic pages with Gatsby, um, potentially integrating with something like Apollo on the front end um, as we sort of launch new brands and grow our existing ones, doing more with internationalization. We're really excited about, I think there's a new blog post up on Gatsby's blog about, um, I think Daniel Wellington generating these highly internationalized sites and that's stuff like that's really exciting. Um, and then I think just in general, this experience has taught us that, you know, we, we plan to use Gatsby for our new brands and, uh, we're already using Gatsby for a new internal tool um, and basically are, are sort of all in on it. It's, it's really exciting and uh, yeah, just can't wait to keep using it. Great, thanks Johnny and Tim, really appreciate that. Um, also, we've had a few questions come in for you. So just a quick reminder to everyone, we're into the Q&A portion of the presentation now. So go ahead and submit your questions. Um, we will get to as many of them as possible. So a couple questions for Johnny and Tim. Um, the first one is more around um, curiosity as why you use Fastly instead of CloudFront. Um, so if you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, so, um, so we had already been using Fastly on harrys.com for a couple of years. And so I think the primary reason for Flamingo at least was that we had already used it and had experience with it. Um, I, I know one feature that we really like about Fastly that I'm not sure that CloudFront provides is Fastly's um, like instant purge. I think with, I'm not sure, it, this may have changed since we sort of did this comparison a couple of years ago, but um, I think at the time, CloudFront, it, it can take up to five minutes to do a purge, whereas Fastly promises like a almost instant sort of global uh, cash purge. And that was uh, exciting to us, uh, you know, just for some flexibility in our different architectures. Okay, great. Um, also, another quick reminder is that the Flamingo case study, if you want more details about it, it has been posted on our blog this morning. So just go to gatsbyjs.org slash blog, and then you can see um, the more details about that case study. All right, um, a few more questions for you guys. Um, how long does your content build take? And how much content does Flamingo have? Yeah, sure. Um, for the build, for the Gatsby build itself, it probably takes a minute and a half. like yeah, minute, minute and a half. Um, we don't have too much content, but we do have pretty much all the content on our site is coming from Contentful, including you know all the product info, including all the static pages. Um, but yeah, it's fairly quick, and our overall builds run like three to four minutes. I want to say usually. Yeah, yeah, the Gatsby part of it's maybe a minute or a minute and a half for. 20 pages. I'm just, like we've just it's never been like slow enough that we've ever even need to look at optimizing it. We might yeah. be doing some silly things there, but yeah, our total circle builds are beneath 5 minutes, um including like all of our testing and type checking and things like that. So yeah, it's it's basically instant from, you know, people's point of view when they want to push out a, an update to the site. Yeah. Mhm. Mm okay, great. Um Another question around content changes. Um, do you have a staging environment before you push to production? Or in other words, how do you have any checks and balances um, to make sure that um, any changes you make uh, will um, yeah. go live accurately? Absolutely. Yeah, this is 
I think one of the most exciting parts about our stack. So um, we do have staging environments. And what we do actually is, um, so in that architecture diagram, we saw what happened when like a merge or a content publish happens. Um, we also sort of have an additional hook there where when a developer pushes um, a branch to GitHub, like doesn't merge to master, but just pushes a new feature branch, um, we'll actually run through that same exact build pipeline, but we will additionally like spin up a, um, we, we can like register like a, a new subdomain with Fastly that's like that branch's name dot staging dot flamingo. Um, and we have a special sort of staging Fastly service and staging Fastly S, or staging S3 buckets. And so it's basically the same exact process as what happens for production, but it happens on sort of our staging infrastructure and makes it available at like a staging link that's password protected. And so developers, you know, in the past we've had developers you know, when we've had sites on Heroku, each developer would have their own like staging Heroku instance that was constantly up and you had to pay for. Whereas for this, a staging environment automatically gets provisioned for you and just built as static files. And like those files just live in S3 and you're not paying for like host or you're not paying for like a server to be up to respond to them. Um, so yeah, we do that and we use that to like run feature tests against those built staging branches before we push. So like if the feature tests fail, we won't push it actually out to production. And I think also, um, it being, even though it's staging, it being essentially the same build, the accuracy of the like staging branch yeah. to production is really close, and there aren't too many worries about divergences there. Yeah, we basically just like swap out some environment variables, and it's yeah. the same thing. Hmm. Okay. Great. Um, another question on how the marketers interact with your site: Are they able to like override any relevant policies to force builds on content changes, or how easy it is for the marketers to get their content changes published? It's it's very easy, yeah. So just directly from within Contentful, um, there's a you know publish site button, and so you know when they do that, that just publishes the site. I guess I'm not maybe I'm missing something about the question, but yeah, they have like full control over. They can publish the site entirely through Contentful just when they update content. Mhm. Mm okay. And then how do you manage search in Flamingo? In terms of like. SEO or like customer searching? Um, maybe the the person who answered or submitted the question can clarify. But um, you can speak is to there yeah. yeah is there a search feature or maybe you could just speak to it? Yeah. In general? So, so no, we don't we don't have like a, a product search feature on the site. Um, we only have about you know half a dozen products, yeah. and I think you know, if our if our catalog grew substantially more than that, we'd probably look towards that, but we can basically just organize them via like our products page and some other hierarchy. Um, so we don't have a search feature. Uh, we do rely heavily on, you know, search engine optimization and using structured data and stuff. And um, Gatsby makes that super easy. And the fact that it's server rendered is great. Um, we use the Gatsby plugin helmet um, to sort of put structured data and make sure we've got the right like meta tags and title tags set on everything. Mm hmm. Okay, great. Um, let's see. A couple more questions. I assume you're having to support canonical URLs and other types of redirects. Any issues with Gatsby on that? Um, no, not really. So yeah, that's that's totally that's true. And that's so that's the thing we use Fastly for. So Fastly has this concept of edge dictionaries, and so we can say um, we can do those redirects in Fastly, um, which is nice. Um, I think. Uh, I think there's one little open bug about you know a trailing slash versus not a trailing slash, but in general, yeah, it's there's uh, nothing. It's been fairly easy, and we can just do that at the Fastly layer. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I think now we're gonna get into some of the questions that came in when Dustin was doing his presentation. So I know we've been trying to answer them as we go. So I want to open it up to Kyle, Sam, and Dustin. For the questions that you've been answering um, over the chat window, are there any um, questions that you'd like to bring up to discuss with the whole group now, or any kind of re reoccurring themes that you see with the questions? And you'll definitely need to unmute yourself if you want to chime in. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll uh, one theme, one, a couple of questions were about um, how Flamingo manages their inventory. Um, so perhaps the um, perhaps uh, the Flamingo developers can chime in on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. So one sort of other 
very important piece of our architecture that really didn't go into here is is sort of our back end. Um, that's actually managed by a separate team. Um, but we have a, a set of custom services written in Scala um, that manage things for us around our warehouses and inventory and you know integrate with Stripe to do actual order processing. Um, and yeah, so that's that's that is a really important part of the stack. Um, not one that our team has worked on very much. I'm I'm trying to get them to write a blog post about it because it's I think it's really interesting in their own right. Um, but I've heard of other people also doing things with um, sort of like serverless, uh, you know, potentially or using sort of third party like either Shopify APIs potentially. Yeah. yeah and, and I think something that is interesting to highlight about this is that uh, with Gatsby you can pull in uh, content from multiple data sources uh, and yeah. render it all. It doesn't need to all live in Contentful. It can live in a number of different places, whatever it's best suited for um, that particular content. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and a question somewhat related is, um, well, there was a question that came in about WordPress, so this isn't necessarily for the Flamingo team, but um, for WordPress, does it play well with Gatsby or is Contentful better? Like, what would you recommend? Maybe um, either Kyle or Sam can take that one. Uh, so uh, I can jump in on that one. Um, the, the, uh, people use a number of different headless CMSs, um, and, and that's really for any number of reasons. Uh, which ones they're personally comfortable with, which ones their clients are comfortable with, um, and so, you know, there's a whole there's a whole host of um, WordPress developers and clients who are very comfortable with editing inside a, a WordPress UI and and less comfortable outside that. Um, so we have a um, we have a page called Headless CMS on the GatsbyJS.org website, GatsbyJS.org forward slash docs forward slash headless um, dash CMS. Um, and uh, it has a list of a number of different um, CMS integrations that Gatsby has um, where you can build your site with Gatsby and that CMS, whether that's WordPress, Drupal, Contentful, or so on. Okay, great. Um, and I've seen a couple of questions come through about how to get started contributing or working with Gatsby. Um, you can always go to gatsbyjs.org. There are great docs there, tutorials, a get started guide. Um, so that can help you, you know, build, start building your own Gatsby site. Also, there are resources there if you'd like to be a contributor to the open source project. Um, so everything will be on that site. Also, a couple of questions came through about the if the Q&A will be posted as well. Um, I am doing, of course, a link to the recording of the webinar, and I will also be doing a transcript of the webinar. And in that transcript, I'll include the Q&A, the questions and the answers that we went through um, during this session. So yes, I will include that in the transcript, and we'll make sure to post that on our blog in a few days. Oh, another theme that has come up in the questions was how how changes are triggered um, in, in either in Harry's uh, or sorry, excuse me Flamingo uh, website as well as any websites in general. Um, and, and the general answer to that question is that um, you, you you're going to want to configure your content store um, with a, a webhook um, to your CI system. So if that's if you're contentful, um, contentful should send a webhook to say Netlify or. If, um, or a Circle CI in in, uh, in in Flamingo's case, and that to trigger a rebuild um, every time content changes. Uh, so that's it, very easy to it's very easy to configure um, with most um, most headless CMS systems um, and most CI servers, uh, and, and and that's a, that setup will will trigger a full a full Gatsby rebuild. So your changes will go live as soon as the build is complete. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, another question is, what's the best example of a large-scale application built with Gatsby? Like something that um, has authentication, lots of users, uh, that type of thing. I mean, my, my, my personal, um, you know, I think each of us has, you know, their own kind of favorite example of this, but I think, I think the Flamingo site's a great example of a large-scale e-commerce website built with Gatsby. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just say also, yeah, stay tuned from us for even because yeah, you're right. Like currently, like Flamingo doesn't have like authentication and stuff, and I think there are these things that are on our roadmap, but also with um, yeah, potential new brands that come out, like that there will be more um, things like that. 
Yeah, there's yeah. also um, Gatsby has a store. Uh, so if you go to store.gatsbyjs.org, um, it, it's also another example of an e-commerce site with, uh, it also has authentication uh, through GitHub and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and is the contentful data pulled during build time or is it always dynamically loaded for each page? I think that's a question for Johnny and Tim. Oh, gotcha. Great. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it is, it's actually never uh, pulled during like runtime. It, it's always pulled during build time for us. Um, the, I think we can see, uh, it, it makes it super easy and it's really nice. Um, I think we could, there may be a time in the future where we want to start doing more dynamic sort of pulling of data at uh, runtime as we get into thing, things like, yeah, personalization. Uh, but yeah, currently it's, it's all build time, which actually makes it really, simple to reason about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, this is a question maybe for Kyle, um, perhaps about Gatsby's roadmap, roadmap, but any plans on making a lightweight UI to handle editing markdown and other content that lives in a Gatsby repo? Uh, there's no immediate plans. Um, there's, I mean, the trick with building a CMS is that there's a lot of different ways of doing it. and uh, so far, you know, we want to focus our time on kind of making the Gatsby uh, core development experience better uh, and, and, you know, working with our different partners who are um, creating these kind of different UIs for, you know, doing stuff. So Netlify CMS um, is, is a great example of kind of a simple UI for editing markdown. Um, Forestry.io is another one. Um, yeah, and so we, we encourage you to like, check those out. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and we're starting to run out of time. So maybe last question, what is the best way to have a staged environment like, you know, build, test, stage and production? Or do you even need that with Gatsby? Um, maybe and Kyle, the, maybe if you could take that one or Sam. Well, maybe the Flamingo team should describe their particular setup. Sure. Yeah, we can do that. Um, yeah so we have so we have three sets of environment variables, like dev, staging, and production. Um, and then in terms of our sort of environments, like our developer environment is just the one that we're running locally on our machines with Gatsby Develop. Um, and then for our architecture, um, we just have two sets of um, S3 buckets and essentially a, like a Fastly service that has a notion of like staging versus production. Um, and those are, it, incredibly similar basically they only change based off like are they protected by a password and like which specific like apis are they calling out to like for checkout and stuff um and i think we've found a lot of value in having like our staging environment mirror our production basically as closely as possible um other than like things like which api it points to um for testing purposes for sort of both feature and smoke testing um we had to do like a little bit of like manual configuration to set that up but it's no more so than like what we were doing anyway to like deploy to production. It was the exact same path, just with a different set of S3 buckets or a different domain name or something. And you get a lot of great benefits out of it in terms of like what I said about automatically creating staging environments per developer's branch. Um, really cool automation you can do. Yeah, because we're able to just do these builds and host them, we can have our like smoke tests act on the actual things we plan to release uh, in our build automatically, which is yeah, very helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Well, we're out of time. Just a quick thanks to all the presenters, Dustin, Johnny, Tim, and to the panelists, Sam and Kyle, for jumping in to answer the Q&A. The uh, webinar recording will be available later today on our website. And also, just remember, if you want to get started with Gatsby, go to gatsbyjs.org for all resources, tutorials, getting started docs, um, and everything that you need uh, to start building your Gatsby site. So thanks, all.